What a special event. We are so glad that you are all here today to commemorate Human Rights Day. It's a profoundly beautiful occasion, a very special event. <coughs> Needless to say, I'm very honored to be here. I'm Joey Scott, poster. Can't forget that important last name. <laughs> and I am, again, very, very honored to be here today. Um, I was asked to choose a few of my original songs um, to share with you today that would um, speak to, to the moment, to the event, to the day. And the first one I'd like to share with you is something that reflects on the repeated mistakes of the past and also the hopes that those mistakes will not be repeated in the future. And I, I know that this, that hope is something that everyone in this room shares. So I'd like to share this song with you now. Why, why are we 
Thanks, Joey. Absolutely wonderful. Uh, I'm Beverly Watts. I am the director for the Tennessee Human Rights Commission, and I am your MC for the evening, so my job is to get up here, get out of the way, and bring up the people who we're recognizing and who are speaking with you today. I'd like the, to, to take just one moment before we proceed. Today, one of the greatest freedom fighters of all was memorialized in South Africa, so I'd like us to take just a moment to remember Nelson Mandela, who is a human rights freedom fighter international. So if we'll just take one moment, please. Today, we're here really to celebrate the signing and the commemoration of the signing of the International Declaration of Human Rights. It is a document designed to guarantee dignity and fairness for everyone. It is about our humanity. It is about our very existence. I would like to first recognize, because government has always been in the middle of this thing called human rights, recognize government officials. I saw a few of them who had come into the, po into the uh, audience tonight, and the problem is I got too many papers up here. Bear with me for a moment. I understand Representative Jason Powell is here. Thank you. Uh, Brenda Wynn. Our clerk. Councilman Fabian Bettinay. From Congressman Cooper's office. Uh, who's here? I, someone told me there was someone here. There he is. Thank you so much. <laughs> Councilwoman uh, Karen Johnson is here. I saw Howard Gentry. Howard may have stepped out for a minute. I think he just stepped out. He will be back shortly. He has another role in the program. Chief of Police Steve Anderson was here earlier. I think he's left. He's having a party, and he's making it about seven other events, he tells me today. But he was, he was here for a few minutes. Did I miss anyone? Yeah, Walter, Hunt. Walter Hunt. I'm sorry. Walter, you know I look right at you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> and we, we also have a number of individuals, and if you will just wave your hands, who are running for office. So. I know I saw a few people, so if you're running for an office, just wave your hand, and then you can talk to people later. Uh, there's, there's a hand there. Did I see someone else? I saw. There we go. All right. Thank you. <laughs> we recognize the elected and those who seek to be elected. Uh, on my job, too, is to, to present a proclamation. My chair is Stacy Garrett with Bone McAllister. Uh, law firm, and she called me this morning. She says, I don't think I can make it. I said, I don't think you can either. So on behalf of Stacy, what I'd like to do is read a proclamation by Governor Haslam, who today proclaims Human Rights Day in Tennessee and encourages all citizens to jo join him in this worthy observance. And it is signed in the first day of November 2013, acknowledging that today, is International Human Rights Day in Tennessee. So we want to thank Governor Haslam for that. I also believe that there is a proclamation from the mayor's office. So I'm going to call up Brittany Taylor Pascal. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Brittany Taylor Pascal. I'm a senior in Middle College High School, and I'm here on behalf of the Mayor's Office, the Metro Human Relations Commission, and the Mayor's Youth Council. I would like to introduce Matea. I'm going to let her introduce herself. She is one of my fellow Mayor's Youth Council members. Hello, my name is Matea. I just graduated from Cambridge High School, and I'm planning on attending Middle Tennessee State University next year to study sociology. Uh, it all starts with me, Matea Ilicic. I'm here speaking on behalf of the Mayors of Youth Council. Human trafficking is the number two crime in the world. Human trafficking is a recruitment and trade of humans without the permission of the persons. They are threatened or forced into exploitation. More than 70% are females put into the sex industry. It is a rapidly growing crime. It comes in many forms, including purposes of sexual slavery, organ harvesting, debt bondage, servitude, and so forth. 
It is a very harsh and cruel world for many people, being there over 27 million hiding in the shadows of our world. It causes many physical, emotional, and mental problems towards its victims. It's time to bring light to an ugly, rising reality. You may have even spoken or passed by a victim without knowing. It could be me, but it's not. I, along with the Mayor's Youth Council, will continue to be a voice for this sick crime and violation of human rights. Thank you. Just as Matea stated, we do believe at the Mayor's Youth Council that it all starts with us. Just a little bit about our council. As you can see, we're pictured up here. We're a council of about 30 high schoolers, ranging from ages, um, well, grades, sophomore up to seniors. We um, have a representative from just about every public and private high school in Nashville. And we work together with council members, with our mayor, and with other youth organizations. To, our main purpose is just to be a voice to the youth of Nashville. So we thank you for your time today, and at this time I will be reading the proclamation. Whereas the General Assembly of the United Nations approved that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights on December 10, 1948, declaring that the recognition of the inherent dignity and of equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. And, whereas a recommitment by the United States to the principles and ideals of the Universal Declaration is essential for its promise to ensure equality and justice, whereas the basic human rights addressed in the Universal Declaration include economic, social, and cultural rights, as well as civil and political rights, all considered to be equally important in fostering human dignity and freedom. And, whereas the Universal Declaration of Calls for All People and Governments to promote and respect recognized rights while providing standards of achievement for governments throughout the world. And, whereas each year the international community commemorates this event and recommits itself to the broader achievement of human rights. And, whereas locally numerous community, civic, religious and nonprofit organizations, including the Tennessee Human Rights Commission, United Nations Association, Church of Scientology, Tennessee Equality Project, NICE, Amnesty International, American Center for Outreach, the YWCA, Community Food Advocates, the Contributor Newspaper, Turk, Coection Americas, and others work to ensure equal rights and protections for all residents. And whereas the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County and the Metropolitan Human Relations Commission share this commitment of civil and human rights for all. Now, therefore, may it be resolved that the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County does hereby encourage the residents of Davidson County to celebrate Human Rights Day. And this was signed on the 10th day of December by Thomas Negri, the Interim Executive Director of the Metro Human Relations Commission. Thank you. to come up and give some remarks. Tom? Yay! I hit a water. Well, it's a, it is indeed a happy day, and it's a happy day because you all are here, and what was a very snowy and cold morning has turned out to be a pleasant and warmer afternoon, uh, made all the better by if you haven't already read it, Beverly Watts' column, and it really is a column um, in today's paper, but it says it all. It, it really does. We, we've done so much, and we have so much more to do. Um, and seeing everybody here, and not seeing more people running for office uh, is something that we have to work on in the future, because it's, it's the basis, the foundation of our work for the future. With that said, and I'll be brief, uh, I do want to recognize one or two people. Uh, the chairman of my commission, Dan Cornfield. Please stand, Dan, for a second. And the other commissioners in the room, Frank Avi, uh, for, for being here today. Oh, I should call you both commissioners. Thank you. And the team, our team here at the uh, Nashville Human Relations Commission. Um, it's interesting that. 65 years ago, in 1948, the United Nations did what they thought and is such an important proclamation. But when you read that proclamation, if you haven't already, it says exactly what we're doing today. So thank you again for being here, and I look forward to doing a little something in the future here tonight. Thank you. Thank you, sir. 
Thank you, Tom. And let me thank those wonderful young ladies. Uh, now, would you think they were high school students? Weren't they fabulous? Weren't they fabulous? Let's give them another round of applause. Our next speaker is one of our partners in planning for this, and it's Mary Pat Severa. Mary Pat is retired after 30 years with a career with the United Nations. Uh, Pat currently lives here in Nashville. She is past president of the United Nations Association Cordell Hull chapter, and she is one of our planning members, and she is still quite active in this community. And if you haven't gotten one of Pat's emails, uh, bringing in a lot of interesting and fabulous people on this subject, get on her list. It is the list to be on. Pat. <laughs> Thank you, Beverly. I would, well, th and thank all of you for coming out this afternoon. As Tom said, we weren't really sure what kind of a day it would be, but certainly the celebration of human rights is important regardless of the weather. I would like to take everybody uh, back actually about a century to the end of the First World War in 1919. Tremendous loss of life. Everyone was shocked, shocked that such a thing could happen. So much so that they called the First World War the war to end all wars. And yet, a scant two decades later, Europe was embroiled in a war that would become the Second World War. And that war waged on for six years. And at the end of that war, again, people were appalled, not just at the loss of life, which was tremendous, not just at the destruction of towns and cities and property, which matters, but at the atrocities that had taken place during that war. How could human beings become those people that would commit genocide, that would try to wipe out a people from the face of the earth. Who, who were we that that could possibly happen? And so the same year, 1945, that the Second World War ended, countries met together in San Francisco in October 1945 and signed the charter for the United Nations. And in 1946, when the first General Assembly of the United Nations met, one of the very first orders of business was to constitute a Commission on Human Rights that would try to reach a global consensus on what constituted a human right, what we owe to each other as human beings. That commission was chaired by Eleanor Roosevelt, the widow of US President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And it met for two years, which may seem like a long time, but think about it. You have people, countries, from, with all different kinds of perspectives, different religions, different cultures, different languages. It's not a small thing to try and reach a consensus on, on what a human right looks like. So in fact, two years, certainly in UN time, was pretty short. And in 1948, the General Assembly adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So we are today, as has been said, celebrating the 65th anniversary of this document. The significance of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights cannot be minimized. The first ever in the world global consensus on human rights. It has been likened to an international Magna Carta, to the US Bill of Rights, to the, to the French uh, Declaration on the Rights of Man. In its preamble, and this is very important. In its preamble, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights reminds us that it is to disregard and 
It is disregard and contempt for human rights that have resulted in the barbarous acts which have outraged the conscience of mankind. And it declares that the only way to avoid this, the only way to avoid this, that the very foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world is recognition of the inherent dignity and the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family, among which are included the right to life, liberty, and security of person, the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion, the right to freedom of opinion and expression, the right to education, the right to an adequate standard of living, the right to seek and enjoy asylum from persecution, and the right to freedom from torture and degrading treatment, among others. But the most important point is that all rights are inherent to all people without distinction of any kind, not race, color, gender, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, birth or other status, or where a person lives. They are all, we are all, entitled to the very same human rights. This Universal Declaration of Human Rights is not just an historical document. It is an important historical document, but it is a living document as well. In a sense, it's, it's the mother document. It lives in two different ways. First of all, even though the Declaration itself is not a legally binding document, it is an aspirational document, it has, in fact, spawned a, a large number of international human rights treaties or conventions, of which 10 uh, conventions constitute the core. And these are legally binding international law. And they include the Convention Against Apartheid, Convention on Civil and Political Rights, Convention on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, Against Torture and Other Cruel and Inhuman Treatment, on the Rights of the Child, on the protection of the rights of migrant workers and their families, on protection of persons from enforced disappearance, and most recently, on the rights of the disabled. And in addition to the international law, there are hundreds of national laws that have been acted by countries in order to, to enact, to give teeth to the international law. But by living, I also mean that not only are all people everywhere endowed with these inherent and inalienable rights, but that it is also the duty of all people everywhere to participate in the recognition of everyone else's rights. It is not just a benefit, it is an obligation. Be aware in your daily life how you regard and treat everyone around you, everyone whom you touch or affect or about whom you form an opinion, whether it's locally, nationally, or internationally. Be a human rights defender. Stand up like the people whom we honor today. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Pat. Every once in a while, we forget that these documents are living and breathing because we make them live and we make them breathe. Without us, there is no action. And we need to think about that and think critically about what it is that we can do every day. 
Nelson Mandela said, the greatest glory in living lies not in never failing, but in rising in every time we fail. And it is that that we think the advocates for today. It is not ever, never failing, but rising, rising every time we fail. And that sometimes is a bigger challenge than we all know. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Angie Harris, the Director of Foreign Language Institute, to come forth and tell us about one of our Rising Star Advocate Awardees. And after that, after she finishes it and the awardee comes up and accepts the award, I'm going to ask Stephen Fatopoulos, the Executive Director of, T of Tennessee Immigrant and Refugee Rights Coalition, to come forward as well. So Angie. Thank you, Beverly. Some days we wake up overwhelmed by the volume and complexity of the world's problems. And then a remarkable someone comes along and shows us how to make a difference. That someone is Gottluck Ter Thatch. Each year the Human Relations Commission celebrates individuals have shown great promise in the field of human rights. Good afternoon, my name is Angela Harris and it is my great honor to present this year's Rising Advocate Award to my friend, Gottluck Ter Thatch. Like so many others, I will never forget the day that I met Gottluck. On that day in 2005, he said, my name is difficult to pronounce, so you can just call me good luck. <laughs> His story, however, is not one of luck, but that of a remarkable refugee who has taken risk and persevered with purpose, courage, and compassion. More than 20 years ago, Gottluck escaped his home country of Sudan from the Civil War with his parents and his younger brother. Traveling the most brutal and horrifying conditions, it took Gat and his family over a month to reach a refugee camp in Kenya. Several years later, Gat and his brother were resettled in the United States. Gottluck's compelling story does not end there. Since then, he has become the founder, the president, and the CEO of one of, Nat of, one of three of Nashville's refugee resettlement agencies. He has earned a master's degree. He has written and published his own book, and we will soon congratulate him on earning his PhD. Each year... <laughs> Each year, with Gottluck's leadership, he and the staff at the Nashville International Center for Empowerment assist hundreds of refugees and immigrants in learning English and getting jobs and studying for citizenship and integrating into Middle Tennessee. Gottluck's community involvement is profound. He serves on many boards and committees, including the Mayor's New Americans Advisory Council. Gottluck is a man who has put his time, his talents, his passion into helping others. He is an example of a remarkable resilience and generosity. He is a man who extends his hands to the forgotten to light the way to a new life. There is no one more deserving for this year's Rising Advocate Award. Thank you, Gottluck, or good luck. Nashville is very lucky to have you. The people that are here, the people that are coming here, the people, why do they come here, and what caused them to be here, what are the challenges when they are here? Because we want everyone to be together. We want to have an integration together. People, we don't want to have this group and that group. We want to have one group. And to do that, we have to empower all of us. We have to work together so that we can build a community that can grow. And I think it is my job and it is our job to work together to make that happen. Nashville can change the world in several ways. Uh, once I can say, from your own home, you can call someone. <clears throat> you can call someone who doesn't really know what to do to be successful here. You can connect them with people that have services. 
you can, we can address uh, challenges that are facing the community now in the world through our own, by looking to who do go through so much here in Nashville. Nashville has refugees and immigrants from all over the world that are coming here. And they are facing several issues. They are facing access to services as an issue, public and public private services. English language is also a challenge. You know, health, access to health care and all the other things. So those are the basic things that you can do here. But not only that, these people left their home because of the war, because of the disasters that are national. We can go here and call our representative to support those missions, to, to provide services and to provide the peace in those country. We can go individually to give ourselves to also volunteer and provide the need that our people have. If we can begin from here with people that we have connection with and then also to connect them with all the other and then do the good thing, it's starting from here all the way up. There are a lot of volunteer activities here. There are, for example, organizations such as NICE, National International Center for Empowerment. We do have a need for English language training. People that can speak English who also are native don't need to go for training. They can assist the people who are new who want to learn English. There are need for you know, for um, you know how to navigate the system. You know what do I do to enroll in? To healthcare, the new healthcare that, that we have. What do I need to do to find a babysitter so that I can find a job? What do I need to do to try to be able to drive? And I can take, you know, I can take a driving tra uh, training so that I can find a job, be able to drive. There are other uh, needs in terms of coming to, to, to partner with items of that are in time and try to basically looking at how we can all work together to empower our people in the community so that they can empower themselves and, 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 you know, and, and overcome the challenges that they have. I wrote a book uh, I call My New, American, My New American Dream. That book specifically talks a lot about why do people come here, why refugees and immigrants come to America, what is the role of the United States in the world today, what can we do to keep the United States the sustainable world power, and could it be done by all of us what do you need to do? What can you do to work together with refugees and immigrants that are here? Who are here? Do you know them? So you can buy all the information in my book. So my name is Stephen Fotopoulos, and I have the, the great privilege to present the next award to Stephanie Titro, who's the Director of Advocacy, the Tennessee Immigrant and Refugee Rights Coalition. Um, you can see from, from Stephanie's bio, biography in your program, while she is, while she's still young and, and rising, uh, she actually has many years of working, um, organizing for social justice, working in people's movements. She's been a, a union organizer for many years all over the country. She spent a couple years studying and working in Thailand, working with with people, people's movements there. But what's not in there is actually that she's, a, she's an immigrant herself. Um, she did navigate our dysfunctional immigration system. Uh, it's a sign of prosperity that we were able to lure her here from our, our frosty neighbor to the north. And uh, even more encouraging that we're able to, um, to bring her to, to do this in incredibly important work here in the south where it is, it's so desperately, so desperately needed. Uh, since she's been here and since she's been working in Tennessee, she's incredibly accomplished. This year uh, was the first year in, in over five years that we were able to stop every anti-immigrant bill at the state legislature. That is Stephanie's work. <laughs> After the legislature ended, she spent the summer really heading up our campaign, the end of a six-year campaign to put pressure on our U.S. senators to vote for immigration reform, and both our Republican senators voted for a, an immigration bill with a broad pathway to citizenship for millions of people. She's helped stop harsh enforcement programs here and across the state that would, that would needlessly separate immigrant families. And she helps, help us, helps us see everyday challenges through a much broader human rights lens. And so, um, 
I mean, she, she has such a, a strategic, brilliant mind. She brings passion and commitment to everything she does. She is easily the hardest working person uh, I've ever met. Um, and I think probably most importantly, she keeps us grounded in the, the knowledge, the truth, that social movements, uh, movements for, for lasting social change have to be led by the grassroots communities that are directly impacted. And so I, I'm happy to be here because I'm incredibly proud of Stephanie and she is most deserving of this Rising Star Award. She's a superstar. Our students had the opportunity to work with different social movements and communities who were fighting incredible human rights violations, displacement, um, destruction of their land, and I remember students would always ask some of these community leaders, well, what can you do to help with these violations? And so powerfully I and mean, repeatedly did they say, go work in your community if you want to fight for you know, justice in Thailand, go work in the US. And so I've definitely taken that with me and recognize just the importance of us um, you know, working in our own neighborhoods and in our own communities and working around locally. Human rights is not something that happens or that's missing in other parts of the world. But um, I think we're beginning to know our neighbors and really listening. I think there's such powerful work happening here in Tennessee and um, communities are growing stronger here and, and so I think um, I think people learning more about the issues that are affecting their neighbors and also I think really doing everything that we can to ensure that the people who are directly affected by different policies here in Tennessee or in the U.S. are fully able to advocate for themselves. I think that that's the best thing that we can do is whether we work in businesses or in nonprofits or in our neighborhood associations, making sure that directly affected communities are able to participate and have a seat at the table. I am motivated um, every day continually by um, the, continue, uh, the communities and the people that I've been able to work with um, from when I started as a union organizer to all the communities I work with in Tennessee. I think the courage and the incredible bravery and commitment um, that I get to see every day from, from mothers and children and people who are fighting for justice um, here in Tennessee and, and everywhere I've lived has, has helped me to maintain perspective and commitment and has really motivated me to, to stay involved and um, to commit fully to this work. I think that you know Tennessee, with its growing immigrant population and rapidly changing demographics, I think we have such an opportunity here to really build strong, diverse, and vibrant communities, and really reject some of these um, efforts to make Tennesseans fearful of their new neighbors. But I, you know, I, I'm, I'm excited to continue to become a part of the community and developing solutions and building these um, strong communities. And I'm also really excited for us at, at Turk to continue building partnerships with other organizations and movements and communities to work together to um, bring together really different issues um, and ensure that you know we find common solutions and um, and build build the strongest movement we can here in Tennessee. Church of Scientology and the Celebrity Center in Nashville, and this is the CC Nashville Band, as we call it. Um, and uh, my name is Desiree, and I'm going to be performing this song for you. Uh, it's called How Can I Keep From Singing.
songs in the night if you fail. No storm can shake my inmost calm. While to that rock I sing it. The love is the Lord of heaven and earth. For that. <laughs> Maybe it's because I was raised by a single parent, a mother, but there's nothing that rings so clear to me than a power in a female voice. Whether it's singing, and thank you for both of you. I appreciate that. I'm Oscar Miller. I'm chair of the Department of Sociology, Social Work, and Urban Studies at Tennessee State University, and I'm the moderator for this panel. Uh, this conversation this human rights conversation on education, domestic violence, and homelessness. Uh, as moderator, I'll be keeping time, and then I'll be stepping out of the way so our distinguished panelists can uh, share the information that they bring with you. So let me introduce the panelists. Patricia Glasser Shea, I knew I brought these for a reason is president and CEO of the YWCA of Nashville and Middle Tennessee since 2005. Ms. Shea holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Administration from the University of Dayton in Ohio. Ms. Shea has more than 30 years of experience in nonprofit 
and for-profit health care and human services organizations. She is also the founding chair of the Nashville Chapter of Women's Presidents Organization, hosted by the YWCA of Nashville and Middle Tennessee. She is an active member of the Rotary Club of Nashville and Nashville Cable, that is the civic and business leaders in the prizing. She facilitates a monthly roundtable discussion for cable entrepreneurs and is also a graduate of Leadership Nashville. In 2011, she was selected by Cable to receive the Promote Women Award. She is a former secretary of the American Marketing Association's local chapter and is a past board member of First Steps. She currently serves on the board of directors and exec executive committee of the Center for Nonprofit Management. Our second panelist is Tasha, Tasha French Limley. She's founding director of the Contributor. She has experience as a homeless outreach worker and has spent years photographing and interviewing individuals living on the streets in Nashville. She currently serves as president on the board of directors of the North American Street Newspaper Association and is a new member of the Metro Human Relations Commission. Tasha was the recipient of the 2009 Titans Community Quarterback Award given to the top volunteer in the state of Tennessee for her initial efforts with the contributor. And in 2012, she was the winner of Whole Foods, Whole Planet Foundation's Small Change for Big Change contest. She married Mark, her best friend, who I believe I met. Um, and they used the foundation's trip toward a uh, award to India as their honeymoon, visiting women who were recipients of Grameen microloans. A budding Chai Walla, she is passionate about community, diversity, and answers that we have for each other and those we can find together. Please welcome our panelists. Uh, before we get started, I must say that we uh, originally planned a, another panelist, uh, Dr. Forrest Harris, who is the president of the American. We originally uh, planned a, a third panelist, who is uh, Dr. Forrest Harris, who is the president of the American Baptist College. Uh, unfortunately, the weather probably took a toll on him because he announced uh, this morning that he could not attend because he has broken his foot. So, so um, I followed him for many years, and I was really looking forward to hearing him speak because he brings so much passion to human rights, and I always leave energized. But uh, I'm sure he needs to take care of that foot, so he, he'll be missed. Um, we have about 18 minutes, and so I will be trying to keep time. We have some preset questions, and so I will start with the first question. The first question is to both panelists, how are these issues, domestic violence, education, and homelessness, affecting everyone in our community? And please feel free to speak as locally or globally as you feel appropriate. Start with Ms. Shea. Hi, um, thank you all for having me here this evening. I am the CEO of the YWCA, and the mission of the YW is to work towards the elimination of racism and empowering of women. More than half of our $5 million budget every year is spent on domestic violence. And so that's really what I want to touch on today. Um, domestic violence in our country is what I would call an epidemic. And I am always surprised at how little people know about domestic violence. In our country, 50% of those living in the United States would say they know of someone who's been a victim of domestic violence. One in four women in the United States will experience some form of domestic violence in her life. And every day, three women in the United States are killed at the hands by a man who says he loves her. So bring it a little closer to home. 
Our great state of Tennessee ranks sixth in the nation at the rate at which women are killed by men. 52% of all crimes against people are domestic violence and 75% of all crimes against women are domestic violence. A recent study conducted by the Economic Council on Women quotes, a billion dollars a year are spent on male violence against women in the state of Tennessee. Bring it a little closer, in Davidson County, every 24 minutes, one police officer responds to a domestic violence call. We sheltered and provided over 16,000 nights of stay at the domestic violence center last year, which is the Weaver Domestic Violence Center. I had a call three, four weeks ago from Vanderbilt, a physician who had a client, a patient, a woman with an eight-year-old and a four-month-old who needed shelter, and there was no availability at the Weaver Center. There was no availability at Morningstar. There was no avail availability at Mary Parish. We could not find that woman and those two children shelter anywhere. The YW has been involved in domestic violence for over 40 years, and it is not getting better. We are very good at treating the aftermath. We are very good at helping women leave abusive relationships, but the relationships continue. Last year, 15% of all homicides in Davidson County were domestic violence related, and for the past 10 years, 15 to 20% of all homicides each year are domestic violence related. I think we have a problem. Thank you. <laughs> it, it, it's a tough question. I mean, how do, how do these things affect all of us? I think um, my co-panelist touches on it when, you know, 50% of people even know that they know someone who's, who's uh, been a victim of domestic violence. Um, I think many few, much fewer of us think that we know someone who is homeless or, or who has been homeless. Um, and I was one of those people that didn't know that I really knew anybody who'd been homeless. My story has been, um, 10 years ago when I moved to Nashville, almost 12 years ago, I introduced myself to a homeless man near where I worked. That was a really scary moment for me. Um, it's kind of funny to think about it now, but I was terrified. I walked up to him, stuck up my hand, and introduced myself because I saw him every, every day, and we never addressed each other. And um, I realized if he had been a, quote, normal person, we would have introduced ourselves to each other long ago. Like if I saw you every day at Starbucks, eventually I'd be like, who are you? Mm -hmm. You know, but because, I, because he perceived a difference in me and I perceived a, a class difference in the two of us, we never introduced ourselves to each other. But, but one day I decided to do that. And, um, but at that point I didn't realize that homelessness it touched my life even closer than that. As I got to, got to travel the streets of Nashville with outreach workers, got to interview and photograph people, I realized there was such a familiarity to me. You know, it's, it's this culture. There was a culture among the people I was, I was visiting with. There, the sense of humor and the, and the intelligence and the, the type of interaction, the openness, this was very familiar to me and I couldn't figure out why. And it wasn't until years later I realized they remind me of my brother. Like, oh my goodness, what is that? Um, I didn't know my brother had been homeless. He's about 10 years older than me, and um, I knew he, he was adopted by my family when he was eight years old um, it, uh, in foster care. I almost said a victim of foster care, so there's a Freudian slip there for you. Um, but he had been in many foster homes and came to our family when he was eight. And um, I knew he had trouble with, with addiction. He came to us with already addicted. Um, I knew he had trouble with the law, but I never knew he had been homeless. And um, one Thanksgiving, after I'd already been interacting with our homeless community here, we sat down over dinner. He happened to be out of jail. I happened to be home for Thanksgiving, so we intersected. And he referred to himself as us homeless people. And that was something I had not realized until that point. So that was really a light bulb moment for me. Um, I think that, you know, there, there are many ways this affects us all. 2,000 school children are estimated to be homeless within our community, and, and that's incredible. Yes. Children who are homeless. And, um, and thank goodness they're getting the education that to be able to touch on that. But thank goodness we live in a community where they are, they are being able to, to be, you know, to get an education that they need. Um, but I think, you know, rising costs of incarceration, first of all, um, incarcerating our homeless community, that is extremely expensive. And so anything that can help us reduce that rate, that, that affects us all, as well as health care. 
when when people who live on the streets they're unable to even get get to what would what to me or you would be able we would be able to go to the doctor immediately and get things checked things go unchecked for a number of years and that just increases costs for the rest of us mm -hmm. but i think you know maybe the number one the number one way i think it affects affects all of us is that face to face interaction that 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 perceived caste almost within our community where we're unable or have been unable to dialogue um, a dialogue with the person next to us, with our neighbor, with the person we're sharing a sidewalk with or a bus with. And um, so that's one thing that I think that, that with the contributor, we were just trying to create a source of income for people who lived on the streets. They needed a flexible source of income with very complicated lives. We all have complicated lives. Throw not having a stable residence on top of that, and that's, of course, an added complication. But the, the thing that I've seen in the community that's made the most difference and it's affected, what I'm hearing has affected people the most, is that excuse to dialogue, to talk with the person in front of us. And I'm proud and honored and humbled to have been a part of that. But that, that excuse to dialogue, that face-to-face -face interaction with people that we perceive as different than us, that are not so different than us, um, that's, that's been a great, a great change in our community. And so I think that that's one of the ways that, that we're the most affected um, by homelessness is this, is this perceived difference in, in, in just because that person has experienced that in their lives. Now I'd like to ask each of our panelists a question that uh, pertains to their particular exper expertise. Uh, Ms. Shea, can you discuss the relationship between domestic violence, education, and homelessness? Ms. Shea, can you discuss the relationship between domestic violence, education, and homelessness? Thank you. Thank you. Um, domestic violence isn't about violence, it's about control. And when a woman finally decides that she can leave, that she's got no other options available for her, one of her first issues is housing. So she's picking up all that she can carry, she's taking her children, and she's leaving her physical home. So where she goes next, where she takes those kids in the middle of the night is really important. And I've spent a lot of time with women who have spent time on the street, time in cars, time with their relatives. What we know is domestic violence is one of the leading causes of homelessness for women. Once a woman is out of that relationship, and because it is so much about control, what the YW tries to do is help her first be safe, keep her children safe, but then develop the skill set she needs to be self-sufficient. And self-sufficiency is directly tied to education, employment, and permanent housing. So if a woman is unable to access or have an education, her ability to earn an income is extremely limited. Minimum wage doesn't cut it. So we try to help women get a high school degree, get to college if possible. Then through that process, they're able to get a better job, earn a better living, maybe just work one shift so that they're home with their children. They're able to take care of their kids. And today, I don't know if you all even realize what it cost to rent a two bedroom apartment in this city. It's outrageous. And the limited number of low income housing units that are available to women and men is, it's, it's scarce. And so the ability, what the YW tries to do is we have a transitional housing program and if a woman really wants and has the ability to move out of that violent relationship, she can stay at our shelter for up to 45 days and then go into our transitional housing program for another 12 months. And the purpose of that program is to help her stabilize, is to help her replant her roots in a community and it's assisted rental so that at the end of that 12 month period, at the end of pretty intense case management, we leave her and she stays Put. So we hope that she was extracted but replaced at another place that's safer for her. Oh, I'm sorry. That's I thought okay. you had the same question. <laughs> I'm not sure. We'll see. 
<laughs> I hope you're smarter. Ms. Lemley, can you elaborate on some of the causes of homelessness and opportunities you see for community organizations, citizens, to work to prevent these causes? Excuse me. Thank you. Um, I want to go back and, and, and kind of elaborate or touch on, touch on some of what Ms. Shea said, um, and it kind of does lead into mine, that I recently heard poverty defined as the extent to which someone lives without resources. And so I think homelessness, education, and domestic violence, they are all symptoms of poverty. And they interact with each other, and in many ways they depend on each other, and they feed each other. So, um, so yes, I think when you're, poverty is very complex, and all of these symptoms of poverty are almost as equally complex. So the reasons that someone may be homeless vary as much as the reason someone may have a stomach ache in some ways. Maybe that's really simple. Maybe it is as tragic and as simple as a fire that someone had everything and then they have nothing 10 minutes later. Or it can be as complex as a life of lack of education, um, domestic violence, different, different types of abuse, even addiction or mental <coughs> illness. Very complicated things in themselves that can lead to homelessness. So I'm um, trying to remember my exact question again, but how can the community, what are some, what are some of the causes and how can, can the community be more involved? Yes. Um, I think that the way, and, I, and this is where I don't feel like an expert because it is so complex, um, that, that the community involvement I see, I'll go back to that face-to-face -face interaction and creating a community around an individual that can start addressing all of these symptoms of poverty, of all the symptoms of why all the resources available to someone or many of the resources available to someone are lacking. Um, for example, that, that I, can't, I can't be, or my spouse can't be the only person to me. He can't be the only thing in my life and I can't be the only thing in his life. As much as we try to be one of the main sources of support in each other's lives, we can't be everything. So a single person or a single organization can't be everything to someone who's experiencing any of these compl complex system, sy symptoms such as homelessness. It takes a community coming around an individual, someone who does nothing but say hello to them every day, that is an area of support. Someone that has a passion for finances that can start to address those financial needs. Where are you, where do you need to go? We all have different counselors, we have doctors, we have attorneys, we have different peoples in our lives, our pastors who enrich our lives and help direct us in the way we need to go in all of the main areas in our lives. And, and just, like, just, like, just like us, we're just people. So someone with the, any of these symptoms of homelessness, lack of education, or experiencing domestic violence, people need to come around them. And we, we fill in where we are called to fill in, where we have a passion for filling in, in the needs within that person. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank you all for participating. We're out of time now. I want to thank Ms. Limley and Ms. Shea for their uh, sharing their information with us. God, I'm back. Happy day, happy evening, per se. After hearing of those challenges and, and, and having you all here, I have the opportunity uh, this evening to talk about a friend, a friend not only to me, uh, and a, but a friend to this, our community, and a friend to so many of us here in the United States today. It's the 2013 Human Rights Lifetime Award. So this afternoon, Elliot Osmond, who spells his name with two L's and two T's because his parents knew <laughs> that they'd have to do it that way. Because he likes to change things. And he is so positive in how he changes things on a daily basis. You know, he, he tends to annoy a few people. Yay. <laughs> um, but, but when he does that, all right, he enables others to rise up. Uh, a few examples of that in a few moments, uh, but I do want to go over uh, a couple of things about, I could read for about four and a half hours on Elliot's background, but this is kind of fun. What people don't know about Elliot, uh, that he was a clergy member. So I guess we can call him 
like Reverend or something, but we're not going to do that this evening. <laughs> All right. Uh, he graduated from Vanderbilt Law School in 1975. All right. And again, uh, from uh, he got a certificate program for instruction for lawyers from Harvard Law School in 1990. He focuses his practice on immigration law. He's a member of almost every immigrant lawyer association you can imagine, so I'm not going to read them all here. Uh, in addition to representing hundreds of clients, uh, before the U.S. CIS and the U.S. ICE, which is now called ICE, it used to be called the INS. Uh, he has also tried immigration cases before numerous immigration courts in Memphis, Atlanta, New Orleans, uh, the Board of uh, Immigration Appeals in Washington. He has rep represented immigration clients in numerous courts, too many to mention. Um, if you name the court, he's probably been there. Um, in addition, he had, was formerly an elected representative here in the state of Tennessee. Wow, you should have kept that one up. <laughs> but what, what Elliot has really done is to be our friend, my friend, and a friend to, to so many who need his help. I've had the opportunity uh, to call Elliot personally at about 11 o'clock at night uh, because there was a pregnant woman and I get emotional on this, that got arrested here uh, in Nashville, uh, was uh, sent to jail uh, about two days before the July 4th holiday. Uh, she ended up delivering a baby uh, in the hospital that weekend, and you all know the outcome of that, but Elliot Osmond was the one to step up without question and answer his phone at 11 o'clock at night. What's with that, Elliot? Elliot, on a more personal note, and many of you may have heard it, uh, and I can go through so many different areas that Elliot has helped with in this, our new arrival community, but one of the most important ones um, is helping in the elimination of our 287G program. Uh, Elliot has been, yay! <laughs> has just been amazing in that pursuit. We were just up in New York, uh, Avi and I and Captain Mike Alexander, where we talked about the elimination of our 287 program and got a round of applause for that. Uh, and Elliot was mentioned there. So in addition to that, Elliot uh, took on another cause, and that was helping me with my mother-in-law <laughs> obtain her citizenship this past Thursday. Oh. Yes. <laughs> At 93 and a half years old, it was her life's dream. Um, and she, <clears throat> she wanted to be here tonight, but she's in the hospital. Uh, and she wanted to congratulate you, Elliot. And let's look at the video. So thank you all. So, uh, Neil was a friend one day. And he asked me, or I asked him, uh, you know, I'm really not feeling satisfied doing what I'm doing now. Do you have any ideas on what I can do uh, with my law degree and my law license to really help people? And he came up with the idea of immigration law. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought that is what I, that, that really is what I'd like to do. Because this country was built by immigrants. This is an immigration nation. And um, the more I thought about it, the more I fell in love with the idea. And that's, uh, that's what uh, started my immigration law practice. I have thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, it has been the most satisfying thing I have ever done in my life. One day, I got an invitation from Sheriff Darren Hall to serve on the 287G um, advisory group. Much to my chagrin, my worst fears were confirmed when they started deporting everybody for the slightest mishap, such as uh, driving without a license. Racial profiling was at its height during that time. Uh, Hispanics were being arrested right and left for practically nothing. Uh, U.S. citizen children of these immigrants were being ripped away from their parents. 
And uh, I just decided I'd had enough. And that's when I really began fighting in earnest for these poor people. And the rest is history. Uh, I've, I've tried my best to advocate for them and at the same time serve their legal needs. But, the, but not stopping there, really advocating for the entire immigrant community. And that includes not only Latinos, but it includes Muslims, it includes uh, all stripes of immigrants. In my mind, there's no difference between them. Look around at, at your community. Uh, you don't have to go very far in this very city to see people suffering. Look, uh, as I came here today, I passed three different people that were selling the newspapers on the corner. Those people are standing out there in that biting wind. I stopped today to get gas at a gas station. And I couldn't hardly stand it. I couldn't wait to get back into my warm car. And then I looked at those poor people selling those papers. And I thought, bless their hearts, they're doing the very best they can. My son will not pass one of those people without giving them a dollar. He doesn't want the paper, but he wants them to have a dollar. And he's very proud of that. And I'm very proud of him. That's where it starts, is with those small deeds. And then you'll become more aware of people around you and needs around you. And the, the rights of people that are being violated as you become more and more aware of the community around you. So the first step is just look around and be aware and don't be self-contained. I'm so thankful for this recognition. I was totally shocked when I got this email. And uh, I really don't feel I deserve it. There are many people doing a lot more in this community uh, that, that should be recognized. But I appreciate the honor, and it is an honor, and I appreciate it very much. You're very kind. Yay. Elliot, it's a hood ornament. <laughs> Stop you with that on your car. <laughs> I think you get out of the way. Take your time. <laughs> so Howard just had back surgery. So let's give him a round of applause for being here. Thanks, and how many of you had? Oh, a few. Yeah, a few. <laughs> wow. How's everybody doing today? Uh, I did have back surgery a week ago today, but uh, I was not going to miss this opportunity. And so I did talk to my doctor, Mama, and he told me, he told me to come, do what I need to do, and leave. Well, I didn't. She's saying y'all can't hear me. That's why she's getting this award. Um, um, and, and so, uh, for, unfortunately, I came early, and, and, and I'm just now doing what I need to do. And I might be a little loopy because, you know, the things that they give you to keep from hurting so bad. But the fact is, that it's an honor to be here. And it's an honor to be here to present my mother, Carrie Gentry. And when I think about this, and, and uh, Mr. Osmond, congratulations to you. And, and also, uh, Mayor, where's the Mayor? Oh, there you are. Yeah. See, I'm not seeing good, Mayor. You can, you can tell them all. Yeah, I'm not seeing good, but uh, I want to congratulate each and every one of you. You know, my mother probably is the, uh, if you talk to my mom, uh, after she gets through talking to you, you would wonder why anybody would ever want to give her anything. Because she, she always talks about everybody else. Uh, she does not acknowledge herself as being great or special. She just acknowledges her as being a human being who cares about people, who does what needs to be done, and, and she does enjoy seeing the results. And for you all to have noticed that and still thought of her as a person worthy of lifetime achievement, 
means that her actions are definitely speaking louder than her words. She has raised all of us to understand what um, civil rights and human rights are. And you might think that my mama's quiet and just has that little smile on her face. She, she can fool you like Mama Inez, Ms. Crutchfield. Uh, they can fool you. They can fool you. But I've never known a, a lady who is tougher than my mom. I've never known a lady who is more uh, concerned about people treating fairly and, and, and people treated right than my mother. And you all can read about her and, and you know her part, the role she played during the civil rights um, and what have you, and, and I believe you can read. But I'm going to tell you a few things, and I'm going to sit down, it won't be but two, that uh, she did that just kind of give you an idea how tough she is. And one is when we were shopping at Harvey's. Y'all remember Harvey's? Anybody old enough? And I had to go to the bathroom. And so we were in the second floor level. And I had to go to the bathroom. So mama asked where the bathroom was. And they said, well, you, you know, you can't use the bathroom here. And my mom's like, what? You, I've got this little boy. He needs to use the bathroom. They said, well, you can't use the bathroom here. And so my mom said, well, I'll tell you what then. You don't let me use the bathroom. I'm going to let him blah, 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 right there on the floor. <laughs> and uh, anyway, we got to use the bathroom. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and another was... In Hendersonville one time, on the lake, and we were uh, trying, you could buy a boat, but we couldn't eat at the restaurant. That was really crazy. And my mom, I had ordered a hamburger and french fries, right? Something like that. And they told us, we were at the bar sitting there, and they told us we had to go around the back to get it. And so we're sitting right here at the bar. I think I wanted water. Was it water, Mama? And he said we had to go around to the back. And... Uh, so, of course, I wanted my water, I wanted my french fries, hamburger. I didn't care about whether they made me go around the back. I was a little boy. But she said no. And so she asked the guy next to us, who was white, she said, do you think it's fair that he has to go around the back? We have to go around the back and you don't? And bottom line is, I didn't get my hamburger and french fries because she would not um, uh, lower herself to that. And that's just two examples, not of a woman who who is just foolish, or a woman who is so mean that she would not uh, conform. It's a woman who had the backbone, and still has the backbone today, to stand up for right, for equal rights. A lady that will not allow discrimination to happen, even within our family, she won't allow it. And this is the lady that's getting that award today. So for me to come out with my back hurting, uh, is no big deal for what she's done for me because I would not have, I promise you, I would not have accomplished the historic things that I have been able to accomplish if it had not been for my mama paving the way for me all my life, putting me in places that I wasn't welcome because she knew that the time was going to come, continuing to tell me that I will do these things, that I will succeed, that I am a person that can be this and be that. And I have become that because of my mother. So, uh, Kara Gentry, I love you, I honor you. When it's time to give you your awards, I got your three granddaughters coming because I can't pick the thing up, it's too heavy. And uh, it'll hurt my back. So, again, I know I've been rambling and I've done it on purpose because I'm talking about my mama. And uh, I wanted to make sure you knew something that nobody knew. So, roll the video. Congratulations, Mike. Uh, oh, uh, when I was there, in, in the senior year, I was selected to live, uh, to be a senior mentor. To, so that meant that I would live in the freshman dormitory and to uh, help the freshmen with whatever they might need help with coming into the college for the first time. And uh, that, uh, as I think back over it, was one of the inspirations to me that the administrators and the faculty there at Howard University, where I got the opportunity to go in Washington, D.C., uh, in that I was chosen to be a mentor. 
it said to me that the administrators, I mean, and I don't know whether I thought about it back in that day or not, but now it says to me that it was really an inspirational thing to me to feel that the administrators and the teachers felt that I had listened to them and had adopted some of their uh, uh, teachings and so forth and had caught their teachings had caused me to be the kind of person that could inspire other people because obviously they had it inspired me to be the kind of person that they thought would be a good mentor for those freshman students coming in. So things like that caused me in this day and time to feel that uh, to help somebody is the thing that we should do. If we, the residents, the people here in Nashville would um, just be very kind and caring to uh, everybody and uh, especially also to, to people who uh, from other countries to be especially kind and caring uh, to those people and they will in turn in my opinion uh, spread that word back over to where they came from and uh, I um, just feel that we should just treat everybody with love and uh, integrity and uh, just uh, be kind and there are organizations that uh, we could have aligned ourselves with that would bring a lot of people together, different organizations here in this city. And I feel that if they would do that type of thing and just sit down and get talk with them and to get their opinions uh, mixed in with their own opinions relative to what might be done to help this city, um, that that would be a good thing to do because no one person can uh, do, uh, you know, all that needs to be done. But when we bring a whole lot of people from different organizations and different places and so forth together to talk about what they see as needs and so forth with the poverty and with the housing and with the education and all of those types of things uh, what might be done if they, if they would come to some conclusions and really work toward getting those things done it uh, might be helpful I just keep on trying to live the best way that I can in order to uh, influence good things to happen uh, in myself as well as the other people around me. So anyway, that's been sort of my life. And I, pre and I, I present to do, 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 do. I present to you and others uh, my mother Carrie Gentry and so you heard about her giving, right? That's why I always have to buy shirts because she taught me how to give the shirt off my back all my life. And so I still do, uh, even today, because of her teaching. So mom, that's your award, and here's your mic. She can hold that. Uh -uh, she can't hold it. Oh, I don't. Oh, she doesn't speak? I don't need to do anything oh, but say speak. thank you okay. so very much. <laughs> And I want to let's see, it's on mute, I think. Well, it's not working. I want to present to us this evening uh, the Reverend James Thomas, who serves as pastor of the Jefferson Street Baptist Church here in Nashville, Tennessee, for just over 42 years now.
But our reason that we are here tonight is because he is more than pastor of the Jefferson Street Baptist Church. He is a person who allows God to love the world through him. I, I firmly believe that there are many people who do not fulfill the will of God for their life because they are resistant to some of the places where God wants them to serve. And what I've learned about Pastor James Thomas, there's no place too low for him to serve and no place too high for him to serve. Any day of the week, you find Pastor Thomas out in front of the Jefferson Street Baptist Church in conversation with winos, in conversation with drug addicts. In that same day, you will see him sitting in the conference room of the governor of Tennessee. That's the kind of person he is, that there's no place too large or too small for him to serve. And he doesn't do it to get on us like this. He does it because of his love for humanity. He loves God and he loves humanity. And I firmly believe that this evening we are doing the right thing in showing honor to the Reverend James Thomas. Many of you call Tex, I often call him just pastor because he is pastor par excellent and preacher par excellent. I tell anybody without any reservation at all, and I'm a preacher too, but if you want the best preaching there is in Nashville, you'll find it taking place at the Jefferson Street Baptist Church every Sunday morning at 8 a.m. and 11 a.m. when Pastor James Thomas is the preacher. So this award will be presented to Pastor James Thomas. Yeah. Uh, I've seen this kind of thing uh, work in my community in Texas where the, the black preacher was the leader and uh, they aided my family. There was a time when uh, the Ku Klux Klan and so forth was threatening us. We can look to the black preacher. And so I have that feeling that uh, uh, that's my job, uh, to help people. We're going to be a people that's honest uh, and have a good sense of history. And what do you want? What do you see? Oh, uh, it needs to be changed. I think that we've got a lot of folks that can see stuff. But uh, is it in you? Uh, do we have the guts? I believe that people have a lot of sense but no guts. And I believe that God gives us everything but guts. We have to have that. And uh, if Nashville is going to be changed, we're going to have to be more conscious of uh, humankind, conscious of the need. Um, we're going to have to learn how to live without looking for crumbs. Um, we got to learn how to starve at a picnic. That's what we got to do. Uh, fight, fight the issues. Do we have the real people running our city, black or white? Um, can we depend on them okay. to do the right thing? Someone asked Winston Churchill, what would make a good leader? And Winston Churchill said, a good leader is someone who can make decisions and deal with the consequences. And we have a people who like to make decisions but don't want to deal with the consequences. I'll tell you what I've learned in the 60s that we follow leadership. Uh, no one during the 60s jumped ahead of 
anyone that was leading. The old folk would say, if you stay in line, you will make it to the wonder. And we have a lot of folk who want to be leaders, but they don't want to stay in line. And they're jumping out of line. And when you get to the wonder, they don't have any money to buy anything with. <laughs> so I would say to them, stay in line, learn. Uh, what do you want? Where you want to go? What do you want to do? Uh, I believe that uh, God give us influence, but that influence belong to the people. Use it or lose it. wonderful evening, but I think we really do need to thank, God luck, Stephanie, Mrs. Gentry, Maya Tex Thomas, and Elliot Osmond for that that you do and you will continue to do. It is, it is your dedication and perseverance to securing a more equitable and just community for all of us that is critical to us having a world, a world that meets the ideal of the International uh, Declaration of Human Rights. We are inspired by the Lifetime Achievement of those of you who've gotten the Lifetime Achievement Award, and we are encouraged by those who are recognized for the Rising Star, Rising Advocate Award. Nelson Mandela said, but I have walked that long road to freedom. I've taken a moment here to rest to steal a view of the glorious vista that surrounds me, to look back on the distance I have come. But I can only rest for a moment, for with freedom comes responsibilities. I dare not linger, for my long walk is not ended. And at the end of his inauguration speech, he said, let there be justice for all, let there be peace for all. Let there be work, bread, water, and salt for all. Let each know that for each the body, the mind, and the soul have been free to fulfill themselves. Let freedom reign. He said, the sun shall never set on so glorious a human achievement. I think if we take these words to heart, it really summarizes the declaration. We still have work yet to be done in a variety of venues in Nashville, in Tennessee, in our country. As a country, we cannot survive and thrive if we allow poverty to continue to exist at the level it exists. In a country and a world with so much, people who don't have anything are left to fend for themselves. Domestic violence is not always an issue about poverty, but it is an issue about power and other things, which defeats the purpose for women and for families. It is the battles that we must continue. We did not talk about education because Dr. Forrest Harris was not with us, but remember that a mind that is wasted has no value and cannot contribute. So I think as I close tonight and I ask Brian Fessler to come with, the, with, a, with a unity prayer, it is my hope that we will all join together, as Mrs. Gentry and Elliot and others have said, to make this place, Nashville, a model city for human rights, not just a model city where music is made. Thank you. Let's pray. Dear God, We've come together on this day to celebrate the rights of every man, woman, and child, to focus our attention on challenging issues, and to honor those leaders past who have made our lives 
a bit easier. But we know, God, when we signed up to bring justice and equality to your world, that easy was not in the job description. And so we work and ask your blessing and ask you to give us strength so that one day human rights are made a fact, not an idealistic dream. For this we pray. Amen. We'll have another section from Joe Scott. I just have to say that I am humbled and inspired by our honorees tonight. This was an incredible, incredible presentation and this beautiful and exciting day. And uh, this last song that I'm going to share for you uh, was actually recorded by Miss Anne Murray, but today belongs to our honorees because it talks about the courage that it takes to make change. And it takes how, talks about how important it is to be fearless and the beautiful things that can come from that moment of bravery where you step out and speak up.
so much for having me tonight. And again, congratulations to all our well-deserving